Hi, I'm Ben Furman. And I'm Nate Blyton. And this is Patch In, the monthly show from the soundnotion.tv dedicated to the wonderful world of electroacoustic music. Well, let's take a quick look at uh, Memory Lane. Uh, Chet Udell's Immersion Kickstarter is still going on. Uh, it's got 26 days to go, and it's about halfway funded of the uh, $7,500 that he needs to get this off the ground. So go to kickstarter.com and check out Immersion. For those uh, who don't rem- remember, what is it? Just real quick, give us the one sentence. Just about to say it, it's a uh, gesture control that you can attach to just about anything, and it maps out in a wonderful little app, and you can send it to everything. It's cool. It's gestures. It's awesome. Buy it. <laughs> In the world of audio interfaces, Antelope Audio has announced the Zen Studio. It's an audio interface on USB 2.0 with their special kind of USB. 38 inputs, 32 outputs, a mix of analog and digital, and it looks like it's pretty schnazzy in its red new box. Check it out. There's an article about it on Sweetwater, but it's, uh, it was announced at Music Mass. That is a lot of I.O. Yeah. <laughs> it's a ton of I.O., but uh, I can find a use for it. Um, also at Music Mess, Kurzweil unveiled the new Forte Stage Piano. It uses 16 gigs of samples. Um, being Kurzweil, of course, it's going to feel amazing. Um, I have one of their older keyboards. I love it. If you're looking for a new uh, keyboard controller, go with that. When it comes out, at least. And if you're interested in uh, speaking of keyboards, if you liked the Nord Lead A1, uh, they just announced for Music Mess as well, that the Nord Lead AR R or A one R is being is uh, going to come out pretty soon. That's the rack mounted version of the Nord Lead keyboard, uh, the new A one. There's some pretty interesting new features. Uh, uh, they talk a lot about it uh, of how the audio quality of this new <laughs> analog uh, modeling that they're doing is is really nice. It's 47 different waveforms. A thing that kind of stuck out to me is there's a like button. So they're taking a cue from Facebook or something, and you can, as you scroll through different patches, you can t- make teeny changes like those changes, and then make a, and then go back to different versions of your patch. And it's a pretty interesting thing, but check it out. Okay, and from everybody's favorite maker of iPads, Apple has announced that they are no longer going to be making the second generation iPad as sort of the starter model in the product line. Instead, they will be dropping that in favor of the iPad 4th Gen, which, as you all know, has a much faster processor and Retina display. Uh, Of course, the iPad Air, the 5th Gen, is still going to be manufactured as well. So what this means, practically, is that now you can start to see uh, more apps that are going to come out that will be more resource-intensive, and we'll be able to do cooler things for music. More live sampling, more live looping, more cool effects, hopefully some spectral processors. Should be cool. I would add that the big thing here is that this is one of the last iOS devices that still has that 30-pin connector. So if you've got any hardware oh, yes. accessories that use that 30-pin connector, uh, you're going to be SOL pretty soon. Yeah, it's going to be lightning from here on out. Um, back to Kickstarter real quick. Uh, Some of you may have heard that Neil Young has a very interesting little project out there. Uh, It's called the Pono Player, and it is a high-def, audio-only music player that is shaped like a Toblerone bar. Uh, It does not win any points for design, but audio quality, it should be better than pretty much anything else that's on the market. Um, Also, you'll notice if you go to the Kickstarter page for the Pono Player that they have received... $4,803,000 $4,803,000 in change as of my last refresh of their initial goal of 800000 So this sucker's getting made. You will probably be able to buy it uh, through their website. But if you want to get music for it, you either have to rip your own super high-def audio or you have to go through the Pono Music Store, which will be selling everything at up to 192 k flax. Um my interface is able to go that high on a good day. I don't know how many people are going to actually be able to use that at its full range. Yeah, it's it's a pretty interesting idea to be able to do studio quality audio in your car. It's going to be pretty fancy, I think. Um, and the video for that struck me. Like there was so many. It was like a star-studded cast, all giving their testimonials. It reminded me a little bit of. Uh, I don't know if any of you have seen this. Uh, 
there was a hoverboard video going around, like the the eighty the Back uh, to the Future two. Yeah, hoverboard. exactly. Yes. I, so I'm trying a new thing in our new segments of doing segues. So speaking of '80s movies, if you ever watched uh. the, the Wiz, the Wizard, with its power glove, super race and en- ending with uh, yes. as they were playing, yeah. So if you're if you're into that, we've got another Kickstarter for you. Imogen Heap, state of the art wearable tech. I'm quoting the Kickstarter. It's bad form, but she she's got the this glove that she uses in her live performance, and she's making she's going to be making a version that all of us can use. So you can go to her Kickstarter and check it out. But it's it's pretty fancy. There's touch control, flex control, and uh, all these different things. But it it looks like it's going to be a wonderful new power glove for all of us electronic musicians. Yes, and to the good people who are making this, if you decide that you want us to review it, uh, we can be bought very shamelessly cheaply for uh, new hardware. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> One power glove will get you this. Amount. <laughs> well, not a power glove, but you know, the yeah, key yeah. move glove. <laughs> Gesture control glove, yes. Yeah. So, but this is new thing from Imogen Heap, and it looks like it's going to be really wonderful. I've seen some wonderful video of her using it, and it seems like a really good interface. So can't see, can't wait to see what people use or make using this product. Yeah, I would really like to put one of those on a dancer, among other exactly. things. <laughs> but that's all we have for products. Of course, Music Mess had a lot more stuff, so just Google that, and you'll find even more that we couldn't fit in today. Uh, mostly, that's because we need to introduce our guest. Uh, tonight, we are joined by the newly minted Dr. Andrew Cole, who mm-hmm. I think we've got uh, a photo of somewhere. There he is. <laughs> it's a moving photo, like in Harry moving Potter. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> so thanks so much for joining us, Andrew. Yeah, thanks for having me. Mm-hmm. So, in addition to the doctorate, uh, you've also just finished a Fulbright in yeah. New Zealand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah which, I, that, that's amazing. Can you tell us about that? Uh, well, it was a pretty wonderful time. Um, you know, I, I, New Zealand, of course, has um, a, the, the entire, the, I'd say the culture has a, a closer uh, relationship to nature than I'd say I'm accustomed to in the States. And so it was, it was really, um, it was really just wonderful getting to go and, and meet all of these, um, these just crazy hikers and crazy hippie people and realize that this isn't, that basically I'm not weird. This is the whole (laughs) culture there, you know? Um, and to do things like in the middle of winter, climb mountains and, uh, and, uh, camp and, and, uh, you know, just basically experience this really rich culture. It was just wonderful. <laughs> I'm trying to think of a Hobbit comparison I can fit in <laughs> right now, but uh, none striking me. That sounds well, my like wife a grand and I adventure. Visited, uh, we visited Hobbiton, and it's it's oh, basically it looks like pretty much a it looks like the North a lot, but many other places that are just kind of like rolling mountainous areas. So <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. But now you're back. Uh, you've completed your defense at uh, University of Missouri, Kansas City, which Go is Bruce. yeah, Davis from Missouri. <laughs> so, uh, but which is a program that is renowned for turning out some of the best uh, electroacoustic composers that I'm hearing at festivals and on uh, CounterStream and Pandora and pretty much every outlet. So, tell us about that program? Well, I'd say I'm in good company and, and quite humbling company, to be honest. Uh, um, well, you know, it's a great, it's, it's a really great supportive program. Um, uh, there are, are really four main composers there. Uh, Dr. Chen or Chen Yi, uh, Zhou Long, who write primarily acoustic music and uh, Jim Moberly, who writes both. And then Paul Rudy, who, I mean, everybody, they are b- both Paul and Jim write both, but uh, Paul really seems to focus more heavily, most heavily on electronics. And um, you know, it's a, I think the the richness of the program is they really um, they take people and they really help them uh, be the composer they want to be, uh, and that's what I've really appreciated 
um, coming out of there and, and, you know, this concern for me to be the best composer I can be sounding like me. And that's, that's something I think I've really appreciated is many of my colleagues sound totally different from me yes. and are doing this really fascinating, interesting stuff. And we can all kind of learn from each other. I think one of the biggest strengths of the program is that uh, we have group lessons. So I don't just, um, you know, I don't, I don't just have a, comp- a talk uh, with my teacher. We, we alternate group and not group. Mm-hmm. But I also, I get to see um, everyone else's work and what they're doing, and they get to see mine, and I get to hear what everyone thinks of, of each work, you know, in a constructive manner. And, uh, and, and the faculty member thinks. And, and you know, so let's say uh, my friend Scott Blasco, uh, you know, he was writing, I remember when I had class with him, he was writing a voice in, I think it was a voice in an electronic piece. And I was able to uh, hear the feedback he got and go, hey, I remember that when I wrote a voice in an electronics piece. And that was really great. So, I, I mean, that, that's just... Um, huge and I, I'm completely sold on that method of teaching now having, having had it and the other way <laughs> Yeah. now that's interesting that you bring that up because um, Nate and I studied both at uh, Michigan State University and we had not that Yeah. <laughs> uh, we had individual lessons and then every week we had studio class but there was never this focus on the idea of the group lesson and kind of focusing on similarities and uh, comparison and contrast of each individual person's style within that studio class. Um, so I'm really interested in uh, the idea of teaching that and especially how you would teach a group lesson when you have someone like yourself who's focusing primarily on electroacoustic music and also at the same time someone who's focusing more on just traditional acoustic composition and did that ever come into conflict or become an issue um not really uh i when um it would depend on the room i was in was the only issue that i ever had was there were times when i'd have lessons in a faculty office in a you know a a hall uh yeah large building instead of a studio and so i'm trying to show like an interactive patch with these teeny tiny computer speakers and, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and that, that could be interesting sometimes or like, you know, oh, yeah. having to basically come and set everything up to show, um, like when I had, uh, lessons with, with Joe Long, um, having to basically get there early to set things up to show how the interaction worked. But in terms of the, the actual commentary and, and content, I'd say, no, I'd say it was treated exactly the same. Uh, and you were really encouraged to do both, which I think is very healthy. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I've learned a lot from from my acoustic writing, and even though I'm primarily an electronic guy, and vice versa, uh, mm-hmm. I'm sure for the the students who are primarily acoustic. Um, so that I mean that was nice because I came from a different program uh, at Peabody where we focused entirely on electronics, and you actually had to do a completely different major or not major, but degree. So I actually ended up having to do spontaneously a degree in composition and a degree in electronic music or computer music is what they called it. But, uh, and that was maybe, uh, you know, a lot of work. (laughs) (laughs) I was good. I learned a lot. It was a great program, but, um, but I, I really appreciated this, this sort of openness and, and willingness and really willingness to let you Try try crazy things, um, which you know I would say, especially in the electronic program at Peabody, that it was the same sort of willingness. Um, but here it was just completely cross boundaries, and you know, wonderful. And I got um, excellent. I have gems from each teacher that I, I carry with me now, which is a really nice. And you know, I went back to see them after being gone. Uh, for a year and a half, I guess, and uh, yeah. and that was nice because it was like you know I've have a nostalgic relationship with the place now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> our producer now, Dave is uh, in the back channel is asking a question. What what's the craziest thing you got to try in terms of interface and, and or electronics or or any kind of intermediate things uh, when you were doing that program or or any of your programs, I guess. Well, so. 
Probably the craziest thing isn't that crazy now, but in 2001, I did video tracking with uh, mm-hmm. uh, dancers. And so this is pre-Jitter. Um, Pre-Jitter, you were doing video tracking, Andrew? Um, yeah, so I used, um, oh boy, <laughs> it was a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, I used, uh, what was the name? It was the guy who makes like the Sonic Banana in New York. He wrote this software. Oh. Uh, but I can't remember the name of the software. But it was, it was, uh, it was great. It was very simple, which was probably which was perfect for me at my, you know, place as an undergraduate. Um, but it basically did color averaging and and divided the screen into grids. Cool. Yeah, it was. Uh, really- it was nine different boxes that you had, and it was able to track from box to box. Exactly. So I you remember, remember using that? I can't remember the name of that for the life of me right now. Yeah. But Jitter came out, and of course, it was like so much more powerful. It came out, I don't know, two or three or four years later. Yeah. So that, there was that. I did. I built. Um, I did another project um, where where I built reactables while I was at at UMKC, and that was fun. We built yeah. reactables and improvised, and and uh, had you know multi-channel video, which I, I'm a big fan of, and multi-channel yeah. video. So that was pretty neat. But That's those neat. are those are mostly it, I think. Yeah. Nice. Uh, speaking of video, I I was just uh, I haven't had a chance to watch it yet, but I listened to the piece. I was just turned on to your uh, your video for Frozen Atmospheres. Can you tell us a little bit about this piece? Uh, so it was um, it it was written for Nick Zulek, and um, he's also um, from Wisconsin, or at that time was going to school at Whitewater, mm-hmm. um, and so I was really trying to tap in to this idea of, of basically how, how cold it is in Wisconsin, really. <laughs> you guys are in Michigan. I can sympathize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I'm I grew in up Florida, in Florida, so I can't. <laughs> yeah, such a jerk. Well, I grew up in Maine, and, and so oh, I, right. I grew up with this. But then we lived in Baltimore. You know, my wife and I lived in Baltimore for 10 years and became acclimated to weather that's a, a tad kinder, maybe. <laughs> and then we moved up to, to Wisconsin, and we were both like, wow okay this is serious you know and uh and so i was thinking about that when i was writing the piece and um you know i'm really trying to uh trying to explore the saxophone in a lot of ways i have a real glitchy sound and so i'm i was playing with that a lot and nick and i talked and he's he had been studying um studying this circular breathing and multiphonic technique which i don't actually use um in the actual saxophone writing, but I put, I recorded it and put it in the electronics constantly. So a lot of the stuff that might sound like synths is actually him playing. Um, nice. that, and I've just really processed a lot. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I did that and then I, I have things like samples of water and samples of ice. I embedded some contact mics in uh, blocks of ice and then let them, uh, thaw out in my bathtub and recorded that. Nice. Um, <laughs> You know, things like that. A pra- There's a prayer bell in there. I tend to, uh, you know, for better or worse, I tend to throw everything in there. You know, I'm, I'm really, I really like to mix, mix up samples and ideas and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So, and I process things so heavily that I'm not sure that it matters. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you end up well, getting what you're hearing out of whatever the input is that you, that you have, I suppose. Yeah. Exactly. And I really think... You know, um, I've been doing it long enough that I can really, you know, I'm inspired by sound, but I'm also, I can think, oh, you know what I need here? And then I just go and I find the sample that I just chopped up and nice. and do the process that I need to, to get that sound in the same way that it's like, you know, this chord really needs to be a C. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, and I find personally that I might process you know, 80, 90 samples for a given piece and only end up using half of those. Yeah. But it's still having gone through the process of that, it helps me to better pick which ones I'm actually going to use for a piece. And then I have this huge library that I can choose from later if I need something that sounds similar but slightly different or if it didn't work in this context, I can always reuse it later. Exactly. Exactly. It's, um, it's funny that you talk about... Cause, so in New Zealand, I recorded like thousands and thousands and thousands of samples 
And so I'm, I'm, I, I do this, but I'm at this place where I'm like overwhelmed <laughs> with samples right now. So it'll be interesting to see how my next piece comes out, you know? <laughs> yeah. Now, you recorded primarily bird calls from yeah, that's uh, New Zealand, correctly. Right. Well, they don't have mammals, so... Oh, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> my, my options were pretty Flat much... Flat of maybe, but... Uh... Yeah, yeah. Well, they, they have mammals that were brought in, and I certainly right. got some of those. Um, but, uh, like, like pigs and dogs and, and obviously humans and sheep. The big, the big two, I guess. And cows. Uh, but, um... Hobbits. Hobbits, exactly. Yeah. Um, but, uh, actually what's funny is my wife and I are so much shorter than anyone in New Zealand. So when we walk along, we were very much, you know, we tease each other, like we're the hobbits here, you know? (laughs) 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 That sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, it's fun. All right, go ahead. Well, the, the country does, you know, only has birds naturally. So I focused on these uh, rare birds that that don't exist anywhere, mm-hmm. uh, you know. So I really um, I, I aimed for like these these uh, kind of going extinct species, which is doesn't sound as cheery as I'd like it to sound. But yeah. like the Takahe, which there's only like fifty of them, you know, and and uh, and uh, Kaka, which is a wood parrot, and things like that. It's awesome. The Kaka is so cool. It's like a dinosaur. Wow. It's like. Rah! <laughs> so, <laughs> um, it sounds like yeah. So I was really, like, I you know, I had in mind. Or sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I had this in mind, you know, when I was going over. My my proposal was really geared toward grabbing these sounds and using it to do creative work. Yeah, so, that's wonderful. I'm sorry. Um, no, okay. I I was just uh, going to say something silly, but I, <laughs> we can get back to the music. It's fun. Um, I was wondering. So this piece <laughs> is for. Uh, I know it's for alto saxophone and electronics. Is uh, how how does it work? Is it yeah. for uh, like is there an interactive patch or is it just pre-recorded audio that they're playing along with or or fixed what, media? How does it work? Fixed media. Okay, great. So um, so I really try to make my my music as distributable distributable as possible. Mm-hmm. So um, you know I, I do a lot of fixed media as a result of that. And I, I've, I have found that, that interactive music is, is a little bit harder to get out there. Um, and often interactive, I really have had to travel with. Whereas, um, whereas fixed media is great because you send it off and you're like, somebody has to hit play, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, on top, right. on top of that, um, you know, what I do is I often, um, I, you have to have a click track or I have to have a click track. Every time I see someone without one. And then I hear the piece and I'm like, why can't I be that smart? <laughs> <You> <laughs> but, uh, but, um, but anyway, it's, you know, it'll have a click track. So what I do is I'm, and I do videos for everything, uh-huh. um, or most of them. And that's, uh, actually was really inspired by, uh, Mark Schneider and, uh, the oh, EABD, yeah. Yeah. uh, festival and the, the quantity of video that I saw there and just, to, and I, I, you know, I, I also feel it's, this is opening a can of worms, but, you know, I think that uh, being able to bring more uh, sights and sound, more than just sound, you know, to being, being able to bring this extra element, I think, creates more of an experience. And so that, that's a real goal with my music. So that's the other reason I do that a lot. Right. And I think that for the audience in particular, that you have to deal with the idea of... Uh, Something I read in a book once. Uh, They're talking about uh, Arab music and the idea of the educated audience versus the uneducated audience. Yeah. That you have people who are connoisseurs of that style and can just sit and listen to it for hours. Uh, you know, kick back with a cup of coffee and just zen out on that style of music. And then you have people who are not, who only want the spectacle. And that by bringing in uh, things like belly dancers, you can help to bring that spectacle about. Or in the case of electroacoustic music, that if you bring in video, not to say that it's a spectacle, but that that can help to draw people in and to better get into the work as opposed to if they're just presented with a black concert hall. And I imagine there, there are definitely ideas that could happen in 
the relationship between what you're seeing and what you're hearing that you wouldn't be able to yeah. just achieve through music. Yeah, I think that's absolutely alone. right on. And uh, yeah, it, and watching some of what you what you have done, it's really interesting. And it, uh, the visuals are very rich, and the audio that we're hearing is really uh, <laughs> you can hear so many different things in it. Um, and I've I've got a screenshot. I wish I could share it with you, of, but my video is toast. Of something that looks like it could be um, imagery produced b by some generative process, and and I and which leads me into a question I had about your video and your audio. So I, I understand uh, you mentioned jitter, and I know that you're a Max MSP user. Um, do you use these uh, programs in your composition of fixed media? In, in, or is that more of an interactive kind of piece realm for you to use? Um, for audio, absolutely. In fact, the entire, I'd say the last five minutes of the piece could, have, could be, in fact, the whole piece could be generated live, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but uh, often I, I like to, I'll improvise, like once I get, um, like say, a sound set that I, I'm really comfortable with and I want to use, I'll improvise in Max and chop it up and things like that. Or I'll just, you know, if I have a really specific sound that needs to come in at a certain place, I'll go into Max and, and create it. I created this whole um, framework, essentially, for myself that's very Jamoma-like. Borrows some code directly from Tim, even, uh, you know, who was one of the writers of Jamoma. I, I don't know what Jamoma is, actually. And I, but, um, I, a I was inside of Max that, that's created um, by... Uh, Tim Place and I'm gonna I'm which is Trond. I'm not even gonna worry about his name last name because I won't get it right. <laughs> like last Sue or something. Uh, he's the basically it's Tim Place and and uh, a few Americans and a few um, a few Dutch composers and sound artists mm -hmm. and uh, and it's really cool. I mean it's basically like you push a button and this object pops up and uh, does stuff essentially. And I th looked at it and I thought, well, this is a little tough to, to use, but I'll write my own, basically, that I'm cool. comfortable. Nice. That's a that's a brilliant thing. I, so hear, hearing about your fluency with Max MSP, I'm more of a pure data user myself, and uh, and I know that that these pieces of software have such strength in doing interactive and live processing things and, and building pieces yeah. in that. But to use that fluency to to build fixed media, that makes complete sense. And uh, um, and do you do the same visually with uh, yeah. using jitter to produce video and everything? Um, I don't actually. I have in the past, but okay. this was entirely done um, in Final Cut Pro. Oh, okay. and, uh, hold on, uh, I was just learning it. What's it called? Motion. Final Cut Pro in Motion. All right. Cool. Well, nice. uh, when I bought my Mac, I got a gift certificate for for fifty dollars, so or a hundred maybe. I don't remember. And so I was like, "Motion and compressor, here I come." There you so. go. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Now, uh, what is the relationship between the audio and the video that you've created? Well, I actually always do it this way. I did the audio first. Mm -hmm. And I really intend it to stand on its own. I haven't in, that that one's actually I haven't always done, but uh, like my I have an earlier piece um, played by Mauricio a lot, Mauricio Salguera a lot, rushing to the sing toward the singularity, mm -hmm. and that was really meant to work in conjunction. But this one, um, I, I just really wanted to get the audio right first, and so um, you know I did that in late or yeah late 2012, and then waited until. February essentially to work on the video for this one for frozen atmospheres and uh, and so you know I, I was really just trying to get the idea in a way it was actually really um, it was really freeing to take so much time in between cool. and so I was really just yeah. trying to take the idea of frozen atmospheres and you know and I was thinking of uh, snow and ice cubes and and how you get these like sort of randomized patterns that that are always falling when it's snowing and and in the and in ice and so I, I took that and abstracted it and and there is even one place where I have like an old found footage block of ice 
Yes, uh, I remember sort that of in the video. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually salt, ironically. I couldn't find a good block of ice picture. Yeah. And I don't have a decent camera anymore. So, uh, <laughs> wow. so instead I just was like, oh, salt, that's ice-like. <laughs> Looks like ice, yeah. So well, visual good. Foley artist then. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, well, I like those. I really love the found footage uh, thing. I think that's it's really fruitful and it gives you a lot of, it's like samples. It just is a lot to work with. Yeah. Now, um, I'm a huge so fan. It's, uh, of, I get them from the Prelinger archives. I was just about to ask. I'm a huge fan of that, uh, the Internet Archive in particular. Um, I love their old 1950s uh, commercials and educational films. They are just ripe for being used as the background yeah. of some sort of piece. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's funny to think about uh, the parallel. Like, so when you're going through uh, these video archives, I imagine you end up with a lot of things you don't use, and just use teeny fragments, do the processes that you're familiar with, to generate what you want, and everything. Um, and yeah, that that sounds wonderful. I have a I have a question. I guess um, we've been talking a lot about uh, software, and then we've <laughs> we've also been talking about. How you went to New Zealand has this wonderful, like, physical and uh, cultural and huge contextual experience of being out on a mountain <laughs> and, and being able to do these things. Um, I was wondering, I, I'm trying to make a bit of an abstract connection here. Uh, as electronic com composers, we end up dealing with computers and this kind of abstract thing that ex exists in our ears or in our eyes in your case or in our internal head and everything um but like climbing a mountain we get this physical experience of really interacting with the space and everything and i was wondering as a as a composer who's interested in connecting with the earth in this way i uh, i just i'm curious about what your hardware connection might be in in your process of making this uh this music and video, and this is a long-winded way to say is like, what's your gear setup like, man? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, um, so uh, so in terms of cameras, I actually use a flip camera that I bought a long, long time ago, nice. which is perfect because it ma it looks like it's sh all shot in the fifties because it's the colors are dull and so it works with the found footage really well. If I get a high density camera, it'll probably be the end of found footage for me. <laughs> uh, but um, in terms of uh, samples, I have a, a Rode um, shotgun mic. Okay. And, uh, and I use that really heavily. And then I have uh, the Roland, um, the one that, that it came out, I mean, I basically bought it right when it came out. It's the six channel. Um, it, it's awesome. It's six channel uh, recording. It has uh, a pair of XY, a pair of Omni, and uh, and and preamps, and they're and it's all really quite good sounding. It's mm -hmm. like five hundred, six hundred dollars. I don't remember. I think mm -hmm. it's I think it's only five. I think it's really affordable for what you what you you know what you get for what you pay is remarkable. Yeah, good bang um, for the buck. Nice. Yeah, I'd have to go look at the at the number. Um, number on it if it's it's not the ro9 i think it's the one that came out after that yeah the ro9 was uh still ederol i think yeah yeah cool. i can go grab it if you want <laughs> <laughs> we ben and um, i usually try to have a prop or two of what we ha the kind of gear that we're doing but you, you don't have to grab it it's fine <laughs> Um, now, yeah, I love it. it. It worked. It's a little heavy. You know, it's bulky. It's not like, you know, the thing I used before that was a Zoom H2. Yeah. Know? And I actually really did my research. So I was like, okay, this H2 isn't really going to cut it for what I want. Uh, and I compared it to the Sony's and some, um, and to the Zoom's. And I thought this was really the best sound for your money. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I thought it sounded as good as, as the, um, you know, many, many times the price Sony's. So, which I think are awesome, but they actually really color the sound. Not that the Roland doesn't, yeah. but the, I think the presence of multiple recording, you know, the presence of the Omnis and the XY for just yeah. using it as a sort of point and shoot kind of 
kind of like uh, lets you gives you so much material that it yeah. it really uh, lets you tweak things. I think in a way that I really like. Yeah, with the different mic pickup patterns, you can get really different kind of stereo image of like the X Y getting something that's right here and something pretty clear in terms of where things are spatially, or the omnis that give you a really big yeah. ambient sound, especially if you're outside. Yeah. That sounds. Yeah, that like that'd be really useful to have that in your palette of sounds. Mm -hmm. um, the yeah. the well, other coupling that with a shotgun mic on top of that. I mean, yeah, exactly. Get really great up close and personal. Yeah, <laughs> something really specific and zooming in, if you will. Yeah. Um, the other the other side of the hardware thing. What I was wondering, like um, composing on paper, we've got our desk, we've got our drafting board, and we've got our pens and and everything. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm working on an electronic piece I often have like a lot of the time it's just like my laptop and a mouse or something like that um, but when I'm using synthesizers and generating content in that way I, I love having like a, a keyboard with all, all the knobs and everything and that, and that kind of interface that I can really uh, dig in with and maybe that's just the way I grew up using keyboards and stuff was uh, having access to that and everything. Um, and so, like, World of PD and Max MSP is different, where, like, in terms of programming it, almost everything is accessed by the keyboard and mouse. Mm -hmm. um, when, when you're working uh, on your music, do you end up, <laughs> like, do you use controllers? Do you use other things? Or is it mostly the, the click and point and everything? Um, well, uh I'm kind of old school in a way because I, or at least I feel that way when I, I work with students now, but, uh, I, yeah, I don't actually, I, I really like, I mean, we have a, for logistical reasons, I think more than anything, we have a, a Roland Phantom and that's my primary sound box. I actually ironically prefer to compose on the Yamaha on, on like the $50 <laughs> Yamaha that I, yeah. I own that, uh, <laughs> nice. because it's, it sounds horrible unless it's in the, well, it sounds horrible, but yeah. it, it, <laughs> if I have the piano mode, you know, just the basic piano, it's tolerable. And then I don't mess around with all the other settings when I'm just sitting down to just compose, to just write acoustic parts. Sure. And, and I'm very, uh, I always start with pencil and paper and jump between Sibelius. And, you know, as I get through drafts, I move further towards, towards Sibelius and from, um, pencil and paper, and I really hope that Sibelius doesn't die, that someone other than Finale can come up and save us from Finale. I didn't say that. Hey, now. But... <laughs> come on. Yeah. Some of us still use Finale here. Yeah. yeah and I moved away from it in, uh, I don't know, 2002, 2001, and I haven't really looked back. Whenever the very, whenever Sibelius came out, and so I'm like, oh, man. I mean, I've taught Finale, but I'm like, man, I don't know what that'll do to my process. So. <laughs> well, I don't know if you've been following what's been happening with the old uh, Sibelius team. Um, they've moved yeah. over to Steinberg, and they're yeah. developing this, what can only be a brilliant new notation <laughs> software. And so hopefully this one will save yeah. us all. You know? <laughs> hopefully. Well, it might it's... save you. No pressure, <laughs> Daniel and team. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, uh, I'm fully committed. You know, dark side so uh yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> it'll be very interesting because i don't know if you guys have used nuendo but that if i yes if I had the money that would be the software i would choose to use really yeah. i haven't i haven't used it at all actually what's what's it like what does it's i i so i had mentioned the experience thing and i'm really sold on multi-channel mm -hmm. um if you're doing fixed media especially but even in i think there's a lot of potential in live works for multi-channel and we're seeing it used more and more too which is yeah. awesome but uh nuendo is like fantastic that's it has been a couple of years because again back to the money issue but uh, okay. <laughs> uh last time i used it uh i was just blown away by the software and it just it handled i think we could do i, I used it at a, a tape uh workshop with hans tutsku and we used it to record 24 channel tracks and things like that which is pretty cool yeah, and it handles surround so much better than some of the other programs out there too. Um, I've only used a little bit, and I would, if I had the money, I would have a copy of it. Yeah. So, 
Well, I use primarily, well, used primarily Digital Performer um, and uh, Pro Tools. Yes, I remember the uh, Facebook the anger that, on the, Digital Performer. <laughs> well, I used to love that program, but I think, I think Digital Performer and I have parted ways after my last tape piece. So mm-hmm. that's okay. <laughs> it's time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I grew up using Cakewalk and Acid and stuff. And so this is like, Nuendo is one of those things that was, was way too expensive for me to get into. And then I got into Pro Tools as part of school and everything. And um, and like the job that I have now, they were using Logic. So I use Logic and it's kind of bouncing yeah. around. But I, uh, and so like, doing high detail surround works is really kind of outside of, of the scope of what I've been doing lately. And so it's, it's cool to hear. And, uh, I've been interested in what Steinberg has been doing for a while now. Um, especially with the, the potential for a new, uh, notation software and everything. So I might, I might try to get a hold of a copy of this new endo or demo or something, check it out. Well, but, and given Steinberg's uh, history of bringing apps to iPad, we can hope that if they do have a new notation product coming out, that it will also have a mobile version. Yeah, they've, they've, I know they've been talking about it a lot in the Steinberg blog and everything. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, and talking, I mean, I know that WaveLab was one of the things I used to use on uh, Windows. And I know Cubase, they've been trying to be cross platform for a long time. Yeah. And yeah. One of, the, one of the nice things about the way they work over there in Steinberg Labs. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it'll be, it'll, I, I really honestly mean this. I don't mean it negatively. I look forward to the day when I can spend a lot less and get a PC and, uh, and not run my, not get my Mac. Yeah, do, exactly. You love my Mac. Yeah. But, oh. I mean, I, well, so uh, when I first got a Mac, it was because uh, I was getting into PD and I, was, I had been using Linux for a while. Yeah. For for the same reason, because it was uh, <laughs> I don't know it was it was cheap on the computer that I had and it could run a lot of the software, but it could run almost as well on a Mac. And so I was like, well, oh, this will be a nice stable thing and, and go that way. Have you ever dug into Linux or doing yeah. the open source thing? I used to run it um, before I, I started running Mac. When it, before OS ten became before, you know in OS nine days, right? I ran. Um, I ran Shows how old I am. I ran uh, Red Hat, and uh, and <laughs> oh, with the uh, Karma project, uh, yeah, uh, stories, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I used to do the uh, was it Year Cam? I forget who did the the Debian, but I really liked that actually. Um, that was my one. Year Cam had some plugins. I don't think they were ever official in uh, the Debian build, but they Somebody did have some. To- it was someone, yeah. They might have just been Debs. Yeah, no, it was a, actually a whole build, I think, in, in Europe. But maybe I'm crazy. This is a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> but I did that. And um, by the way, I, I love PD. I, I use the reason I, I have actually have a very specific reason for not using PD. Mm-hmm. And that's that, and it might have been fixed. I, I haven't really been keeping up with it lately. Um, but uh, it doesn't do multi threading. And uh, I do a lot of video work, and I really need multi threading. And yeah. so. Um, and it actually seems to not like Max actually prioritizes audio. I think. I mean, that's what I've always found on my computer. Yeah. Because if a video is yes. jittery, it doesn't really bother you. But if audio is jittery, it's really quite painful. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> well, and I, I hesitate to say this because this might uh, ignite some sort of flame war on the comments. But uh, my understanding uh, from talking to people from Cycling Seventy Four is that the main difference in how they approach audio is that max offloads as much as it can to the interface and uses those resources first whereas pd loads everything onto the cpu and uh-huh. then from there to the interface and that is supposedly the big difference uh please don't kill me in the comments <laughs> <laughs> well that i'll have to look that up that would explain some of what i've a lot of what i've observed then but i like i really love both programs and i became good in max from working in pd i would say okay nice and i i'm i'm thinking about venturing into max msp land myself i've been a a hard pd user for a long time now yeah never had a copy of max myself and yeah things like that where like having having too many 
graphical like interface feedback things on the screen would sometimes cause things to glitch audio wise and it's just like not not very acceptable but yeah i it's uh, something that you said earlier reminded me like uh when i'm writing even like my interactive electronic pieces i i end up liking uh working on paper at least for a little while mm-hmm. on it at different points in the project or process just because like i mean we we could like I know the three of us could talk for a long time about digging into the technical things, but um, and like in the compositional process, that's the same. <laughs> you can get into the same rabbit hole, spiraling down, digging into little technical things, and and maybe yeah. forget the larger musical idea that you you had so brilliantly almost almost gotten down, <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. But um, well, that's I mean, it's cool to hear so much about this piece that you've. Uh, that you've done. Um, is there anything that you're working on next or what, what's next for you in the world of audio video? Uh, so my next project, um, for electronics is going to be, well, two things actually. One's going to be, uh, piano work for Kari Johnson. Cool. Oh, nice. Uh, and, uh, and I think, uh, David Steele Overholt is going to do, he's a, he works at KCI. He's a video artist or a I think he does a lot more than video, but I'm going to call him a video artist. <laughs> uh, and his, his work's really great, really fascinating. And he's going to work, um, you know, he's going to do the video for it. And he's he's been working with flocking algorithms. Uh, the last couple of things he sent me were really cool. So um, so we're going to, you know, I have that collaboration coming up. And then I'm going to write some guitar pieces for myself nice. as we were talking at SEI. Yeah. Um, about, uh, you know... The idea that you can you can write for yourself and just show up and play is is really great, and it, it solves a lot of uh, submission issues I often have. Yeah, where every every time the calls come out for things, I, I email you know my friends and I say, hey, uh, can you do this? Can you go here? And we always have to figure it out. And I often don't end up submitting the pieces I want to submit. In this case, I did. This was totally what I wanted to submit. Yep. Cool. You know, <laughs> and uh, Nick is really awesome, as you can can hear you know and it is a real treat to work with but yeah but yeah just to uh elaborate on that for our listeners a little bit uh one of the things we talked about at sci was uh, a piece that i had performed where i had gone through and created uh a lot of the standard effects pedals as plugins in max msp so i had a chorus plugin uh a flanger plugin a delay plugin all that stuff um if you are using Max, I highly recommend doing that, or PD, or Super Collider, all of that. It's a great way to gain some programming kung fu chops, and I use it all the time. Yeah. And it was a very nice piece. You could tell. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's cool. It's, uh, well, it's, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you about this, and, uh, and thanks for giving us some insight into the way you work, and uh, it's been great to dig into some of your, some of your pieces as well. Um, nice. Yeah, look forward to hearing the next thing and seeing seeing the next thing you're working on. Um, ben, what do you say? How do you how do you feel about moving on to our last segment? Oh, I think I'm ready. If you're ready, okay. So this month's uh, two minute challenge. This is how we end patching every month. Uh, ben <laughs> is going to address sample rate. So. <laughs> And uh, sample rate, like all the things that we talk about, can be like a pretty dense topic and uh, talk about it for a long time. But Ben's going to do his best. In two to, minutes. D- two minutes. I am huh? going to dramatically simplify some things in this. Sounds perfect. So, so cool. Right. So counter is ready. Ben, you have 120 seconds. Not yet. Okay. Well, well almost. <laughs> in a couple seconds, you will have 120 seconds. There we go. And Andrew, right. I don't know if you get a kick out of this, but this is a green screened PD patch right here. <laughs> There's a green canvas element that I'm <laughs> keying out. Anyway, Ben, you ready? I'm ready. Hit it. Okay, so anytime you open up a Pro Tools session, you see the option to set something called the sample rate to something like 44.1K, 48, 96, whatever. What does that actually do? Well, the sample rate is going to uh, set up the most fundamentally important part of the DAW and most likely the file that you balance at the end. What it is, is it's simply the number of samples 
of audio frequency, uh, sorry, amplitude, not frequency, uh, per second that are sampled by the digital audio program. So 44.1K sample rate means that there are 44,100 samples of amplitude per second in an audio file. And this tells us two major pieces of information about the resulting file. First of all, it lets us know what the maximum frequency the file can reproduce is. Uh, this is called the Nyquist frequency after Harry Nyquist, the guy that came up with the sampling theorem, and it's exactly one half of the sample rate. So if we have a sample rate of 44.1 kilohertz, then the maximum frequency we can reproduce with that file is 22,050 hertz, which is a little bit above the range of human hearing. Uh, two, it also gives us a good idea as to the overall quality of the audio file by kind of giving us an idea of how smooth it is. Uh, when an audio signal is converted to digital information, it only takes points of amplitude and then it steps between those. So you get kind of a staircase effect that your uh, digital to analog converters in your ears will help smooth out, but it still helps to explain why things like phones, which have lower sample rates, sound a little bit more gritty as opposed to things like CDs and Blu-rays. So to summarize really quickly, higher sample rate equals higher max frequency and better audio quality, but as long as you're at about 44.1K, you're getting CD quality, which is good enough for almost everything. Nicely done. Right Ooh. on. Right on the two minutes. That's All right. In radio, kids, that's called hitting the post. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Ben. Okay. A graceful finish as well. <laughs> yeah. Virtual fist bump. Exactly. Yeah. If you could see my video. I'm just doing it a little bit there, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, hey. So, anyway, thank you so much for joining us, Andrew. Um, so, Thanks, Andrew, sir. yeah, Andrew Cole, uh, your your website is twocomposers.org. We can we can yeah. find uh, your new and old works there, as well as your wife's, who I understand is a wonderful composer as well. Yeah, yes. very accomplished, excellent composer. <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Um, I'm not biased at all. <laughs> no, no, no. Exactly. <laughs> well, um, so yeah, thanks again, Andrew, for joining us. Uh, thanks, Thank Ben, for doing this show. And uh, I, I'm, my name is Nate Blyton. This is. Patch in part of the Sound Notion Network. Uh, you can check out. Uh, we'll, we'll have all of our episodes at soundnotion.tv/pi, or you can subscribe in iTunes or whatever podcast uh, catcher that you have. Um, you can support our show and all of our shows from soundnotion.tv by uh, following an Amazon affi affiliate link on the website, or we've got place to do donations and everything. Um, yeah, thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next month. <laughs>